So on this second video, we're going to be talking to Jennifer Foster on investment. She is an investing advisor coach with Smart Plan Investing. And I'm going to let her tell her, I told her that she should tell us about herself because I like to hear from the person. I don't need to tell you about her. She's going to tell us about her. Awesome. So yeah, my name is Jennifer and my company is Smart Plan Investing. And I've been in the financial services industry, either tax and accounting and investing for in July 20 years and I'm also the host of my own podcast called Uncommon Sense spelled like the money of course and what we do there is foster real conversations around money which is what we're also going to do today and if you want to find me you can find me on Instagram at Rich Chick Jen and then my company is also on Instagram and Facebook at Smart Plan Investing. Awesome. We'll also have all of that information um, on our video for Jen. When we, so if you missed that, that's okay. We'll have it in the notes. So Jen, let's get right down to everything, right? Yes. So so today um, on the first half of my video, I just on the first video I just basically talked about um, investing and um, the world of investment, how it's changed in the past few decades. Yes. So you've been in the financial industry for 20 years. You know, I've been an accountant almost 30 years, yeah. you know, so since I was a baby. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, um, and, you know, I started off doing numbers. And so um, the feel of the financial industry feel has changed a lot. And it used to be that years and years ago when we were younger, we're still young, but not younger. Um, it used to be something that only rich people did, right? Yep. That used to be the thing. So today, you know, I, I like the American dream and anything that you want to do, anyone can do it. Absolutely. They just need to have that knowledge, which is exactly. power again. Absolutely. On, uh, and the right coaching yes. on how to get that started. So, so when is a good time for someone to start investing? What do you think? Okay, so the simple answer I tell people is now. Now is always the right time to invest. Now, of course, there's different you know, life cycles and scenarios and where people are at, but if you get your first job and they offer a 401k or some type type of retirement plan where they're matching your contributions, not only are you putting in your contribution, their match plus whatever the market makes. And the younger you are, the better because of the compounding interest. That's when your money makes money for mm -hmm. you. Mm -hmm. So you want to do that. And, you know, even if you're not able to, like, max out an IRA or whatever, if you only can do 10 or 15%, just start out somewhere. Right. Something's better than nothing. You know, one thing that most um, people just don't even realize is how much money they're going to need in retirement. So I'm sure you've heard of the 4% rule. A safe rate of withdrawal when you're in retirement is 4%. So for every million dollars that you have invested at retirement, that's only $40,000 of income. Now, how old are you now and when are you going to retire and how much, how many millions are you going to need to live your standard or your, the way you plan to live in retirement? And we just, in, in the first video, I talked about compound interest yep. and inflation, you know, that your money, wherever your money is, you know, people talk about being under the mattress years and years ago. Oh. If you have it in your checking account at a non-bearing, and you have $30,000 in your checking account, non-bearing interest, losing. you're losing money. You're losing money yeah. safely. Right? Yeah, I mean, like, so I don't see how people think that's safe it's because you're losing. Right. You know, you're losing. Because it's uncommon sense, right? right? They think if I just keep it here, it's safe, not understanding that those dollars are not going to buy as much in the future. Right. So you are really losing. It just seems safe to you. Right, right. So so then our next question would be is, you know, what is the process to start off? How should we start the process? How okay, well, for everyone is really different, you know, and first thing that I say is you gotta discover and create what your true purpose for your money is. Most people will say it's for retirement or it's to buy a house or to send my kids to college, but it really is much deeper than that when you get to the core reason, like why do you want to have a comfortable retirement? because you don't want to be a burden to your family. Why do you want to send your kids to college so they have a better life than you had? Why do you want to buy a home so you could build memories? And a lot of that comes down to love. So if you discover what your true purpose for your money is, then you can align all your spending, saving, investing, and giving decisions with your purpose. Mm -hmm. So for me, where do you start? You start with discovering your purpose for your money and for your life. 
And then I would highly suggest finding a professional that's focused on transformational coaching around our behaviors, our instincts, our biases, and then is also an investment strategy coach that doesn't rely on forecast and predictions, but the science of investing. That's awesome. That's, that's such great um, information for us to look at. So now Jen talks about your purpose, right? So she talks about your overall purpose. I dig a little deeper uh, when I talk about the purpose for the actual money. So when, when she talks about the overall purpose, that is super important because you can't get to the smaller purpose right. unless you have your overall larger purpose. Exactly. So, you know, when I talk about um, our, our savings for a purpose, Yes. And I talk about you just don't put the money in there and you don't have a reason for, for it. it. Yeah, because yeah. you are going to save for college and you are going to save for a house. Those are a, a specific purpose of what this is allotted for. But when you discover what your purpose is, like we talked about this, there's a lot of stuff out there. There's a lot of people out there on social media. They give a lot of information and they can seem like they know what they're talking about. And, Absolutely. you know, we get drawn into the get rich quick thing. I've fallen victim to it. I've had clients recently have even fallen victim to it. And you really got to dig down and understand what you're investing in. And just because someone's on TV or just because somebody makes a lot of money or seems like they make a lot of money, we can look at them and attribute their success to being a good investor. And one thing you should know about investing is it should be slow and it should be boring. It's not supposed to be exciting. If you want excitement, take your girls, take your boys, go to Vegas or something and just have a good time. But your investment should not be an exciting adventure for you, except for the fact that you're fulfilling on your purpose in life. Right. It should it should be fulfilling, right. not so much exciting. Right. Right. So that's that's definitely something that we want to talk about. So and sometimes the right coach is really important because it has the person has to align with what your overall purpose is and and the way that you're thinking so it's not necessarily there there are there are people out there that are talking about different things and they might have ideas about different things but not everything that they talk about you should be following right. it might not work for you in your right. purpose in your time in yeah your and a good coach should be able to help you navigate any option that you have before you, they should be able to tell you the pros and cons, and then you're left empowered to make that decision. But a lot of people, they get here something, because that get rich quick thing, mm -hmm. they end up going that direction and they get hurt when they could be using an investor coach like me as an advocate. Right. Because honestly, all I want is what's best for my client. If they come to me with something and that's better than what I have to offer you, then I'm gonna be doing that of too. Course. Of course, right? of course. But I'm gonna tell you, here's your pros and here's your cons yep uh, and then i'm gonna empower you, you to make that decision absolutely and that's that's so important because you know understanding who your client is is like key exactly right because different advice can be customized to diff different yeah, clients. absolutely like i don't do real estate investment i mean our portfolios have enough real estate right. in them but there are people that, that are really that. good at mm -hmm. they rent they can update homes they can handle any fix it so that might be an appropriate investment for them right so I you know there are people that I say hey do you have any experience with that have you ever fixed a broken toilet or whatever <laughs> no well then that's probably not for a you, good one for you. No, <laughs> no if you're yeah. wanting to be a landlord or something it's right. probably not the best you know right. So. right so so no that's excellent advice so so what are some common questions you get asked from investors yeah, so, well, today what we talked about is we're going to dispel some of the investing myths, right? right? So one of the most common questions that I get is, what are your fees and what are your returns? Unfortunately, that's a very foggy um, thing to navigate, okay? So we're going to talk about that. We're going to get into, actually, it a little bit deeper when okay. we get into the myths. Um, so let's see, before we jump into that, I just want to talk about the four myths that we're going to talk about today. Okay, go okay? ahead. So we're going to talk about four myths. One is that stock picking works. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to explain what that means. I'm going to talk about track record investing works as a myth, market timing works, and what you don't see can't hurt you. So... So do you want to... Let's start with, um, you know... What you don't see can hurt, can't hurt you. Let's start with that myth. You let's, want to go down there? Okay. Yeah, let's talk about that one. Okay. So let me just get to my notes on this one here, guys, because I want to make sure that we really cover, cover that. So 
The myth is what you don't see can't hurt you. So when it comes to investing, it's not just the mutual funds expense ratios. There's actually trading cost, and that's something that's not shown. You don't see it. And so that really can hurt you. And there's a couple other things that go into this as well. So first of all, most people ask this question for, for fees and returns because they're wanting to compare different firms. They're looking for the lowest fee with the highest return. But as we talked about the other day, the way that those numbers are reported and how they are calculated can be very misleading. Fair. So one thing about what you don't see can't hurt you is there are additional fees. When you buy mutual funds, which is a basket of stocks, right. there's a manager that's choosing those stocks for you. So even if you say, well, I don't pick, I don't stock pick, well, somebody's picking those stocks for you, and you can have multiple mutual funds. If you have five, six, ten mutual funds, what's the purpose? Oh, well, I don't want to put all my eggs in one basket. I want diversification. Well, a lot of times when we do an analysis, they're all holding the same stocks. Right. So there's a lack of diversification, and each one of those has a different manager. So this manager might decide, I don't like this stock, and sell it to the other fund that you're in, and you just bought and sold to yourself, and you just increased your cost and lowered your returns. So that's a lot that happens behind the scenes that investors that cannot see. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then when it comes to returns, you know, firms, there's, there's something called Global Investment Performance Standard, but only certain firms choose to comply with this. You have to pay a lot of money to have your, your audit and everything like that. And the thing is that we would like in the industry for everybody to use the same formula when reporting returns, okay? Right. right. But you don't have to. You don't, yeah. You so don't. I'm going to give you an example of where you can get two different returns from the exact same equation. Okay, so follow me. You start with $100. In the first year, you make 50%. So how much do you have? So you have 150, $150 right? $150. Now in the second year, you lose 50%. So 50% is you lose $75, right? So, so now you have $75, right? Mm -hmm. And then if you actually were to compute your average return, you have gained 50%, you lost 50%, so it's zero, okay? Zero. Your return zero on an average return. But what's your real return? You started with $100. Right. You have right? 75. And so you actually have a loss of 25%. Right. But if I want to make my returns look better, am I going to show you my average return or am I going to show you the real return? Right. So that's where it can get really fuzzy. And so that's why, you know, just asking those questions right. do not tell the full story. It does not tell the full story. Right. So Absolutely. We actually think that there are 20 must answer questions for investors. So if you go to Smart Plan Investing and you scroll all the way to the bottom, little area at the bottom, they call that the junk drawer. There's a link there for an investor quiz. It's interactive. You can ask yourself those questions. And if most people can't answer yes to about three of them, even financial professionals. So if you want more empowering questions for your journey, I would check that out. Right, right, definitely. So getting, you know, and asking the right questions is important, but sometimes we don't know what that is. So exactly. that's where, you know, having the right coach is important to, to, to guide you through yep. the questions, you know? Mm -hmm. So so now, so we talked about mutual funds, right? Mm -hmm. So let's talk about stocks. Okay, yeah, so the first myth is that stock picking works. Okay, so basically what you're saying with, um, well, let me back up for a second. Okay. For those who may not know what a stock is, right. what exactly what is, is a that? stock? Let's talk so, about that. Um, we're talking today about stocks that are traded on an exchange. Mm -hmm. These are large companies which investors can put their money into and they're buying a proportion of ownership in that company. If you started your own company, then you would be the shareholder. If you went into a partnership, then you would be a partner with them. You would be still a shareholder. So you get to participate in the profits and losses as a stockholder without the everyday running of the business, right. which makes that nice. Now, of course, companies, they do good, they do bad. You know, that, that it's up and down. Right. Okay, so, so as we talk about stocks, now you understand it's ownership of a company. And then, um, sorry, I just want to back up here for a while. So, so what's, what does that mean? Like um, we've talked about before is when someone says we're talking about equities, right. so that's, a lot of the times they're talking about stocks. Yeah, so stocks can be referred to as equities, stocks, and then they are also in, you can have them in mutual funds, ETFs, yes. indexes, yep. structured funds, all kinds of things. But the 
but the myth is that somebody has the ability to pick the best stocks because that they think those ones are going to do well in the future, right? right? That I can, otherwise they would just own the market. Right. So what you're really saying when you buy your favorite stock is this stock's going to outperform everything else. That's what the myth is. Right. Or that somebody, if you're buying a mutual fund, those people are so smart. They have such good research. They know the right one. They have the crystal ball. Right. So just ask yourself if you've ever bought a stock and that you've had a less than favorable results. Or maybe you've talked to grandma and grandpa and they've told you a story about when they, you know, it's important to really like notice when we've done something and it hasn't turned out as favorable. Because a lot of times we like to brush that under the rug and kind of forget right. about it. And just focus it. on that one stock that did well that one time. Yep. So, and, and it doesn't just have to apply to stocks. It's, you know, your ability to pick the best or to outperform the market is is really throwing darts at the wall. Exactly. Right? Exactly. And it doesn't have to be just stocks. When we're looking at saying that this thing doesn't work, it's a myth, it could be Bitcoin, it could be real estate, it could be gold, it could be any asset that you right. buy that you're choosing. This thing is going to do better than everything else. Right. Okay? Right. So that's a cautionary tale. And... One of the things that I think is really important here that people get sucked into, because I see these gurus, the budgeting gurus or whatever, they have no investing advice, they have no license or anything, but they'll tell people to get dividend paying stocks. I've heard that. It, and it makes sense, like, oh, it's going to pay me a dividend. But one, that's stock picking, right? Mm -hmm. So w in, in our opinion, based on the science that we follow, is it's a destructive behavior, and I could talk about that too. But also they don't know necessarily how dividends are being taxed, right? So with capital gains, when you put your money in a stock and that grows, you get capital gains rates, which can be lower than the rate that you're paying on the dividends. Right. So, you know, there's a lot of things to consider that investors just don't even know to look for. Yeah, they definitely don't. They definitely need to keep track of those things. So so going back to um, going back to, to, to talking a little bit about stock picking, right? right? Um, with the dividend stocks, sometimes, you know, if you're just picking that, they, the company can choose. They have a lot of leeway on whether they want to give dividends, whether they don't exactly. want to give dividends, how much dividends they want to exactly. give. So that can change through time. Yep. And depends on if you have a preferred stock or a common stock right. because preferred stockholders and th there's a lot that goes into, into it. it. Yeah. And the thing is, when we're looking at these myths, we call them destructive behaviors. So I think my belief based on all the research is stock picking is destructive. Okay, it, it, and I, I explain it this way, because people will tell me, but I, I bought this stock and it did good and da da da, or I've invested or so-and-so's invested. Imagine that every day after work you go to the bar and you have one too many drinks and you drive home every day and you get home safe. Is it destructive behavior? You're drunk, so I don't know. Is it destructive behavior? I don't know. Now just imagine one day you're driving home, still one too many drinks, and this time you hit a van full of a family and everybody dies inside. Is it destructive behavior? So it's always been destructive The behavior, behavior. has not changed. You just didn't feel the impact till it was too late. And that's exactly. the same thing that happens in investing. In fact, I had a family member... They got really lucky and got in on a stock at like 49 cents a share and it soared. I think I, last time I checked, it got up to like 14 or $15. But then they decided to refinance their house and buy more of that stock. Mm. And then 08 comes, 07, mm. the end of 07, 08, and the market's crashing and they end up losing everything, including their home. Wow. So when I talk about how destructive this can be, I mean, like I've seen it and witnessed it firsthand. So. Stock picking, stick, stay away from it, in my opinion, you know. So right. there's other ways to invest where you could still own all your favorite companies. You could just do it in a prudent way. Right, right. And that's where the coaching comes in, exactly. right? That's when you get the, 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 the right advice from the right people that's going to customize it for you. Well, yeah. So in a, in a way, it's customized in a way. So it's going to be customized on your risk return of preference. Course. But... And that's what the coaching is for, to explain how these funds are actually structured so that you can get the, you know, you want to get the maximum return for amount of risk you're willing to take. And you could do that in a prudent way without speculating. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. That, that's where we all want to get to, right? Yeah. I think that we should all want to get to, to that. So, you know, 
Uh, so it's looking at mutual funds returns over the last few years. Let's even say the last 10 years. Um, a good strategy for choosing funds for your portfolio? Right, so that's a great question because that brings us into the second myth, which is called track record investing. So what track record investing is, is looking at the history. Typically people, if you look at your 401k, they're showing you maybe 10 years, five years, three years, they're showing you a short window, not like a historical of looking at what markets have done for nearly 100 years, but a shorter time frame. And the research that we have seen is that most of the funds that have done well, like say if we looked at the stocks or funds that did well last year, where do they rank this year? Where do they rank next year? And they don't typically repeat. And so what you're doing with track record investing is relying on some investment firm or manager that you saw had good results and expecting them to do well in the future. And the evidence just doesn't support that. So um, that is not a really good indicator. We really want to look at historical data of asset care classes or areas like large companies, small companies, value right. companies, and growth. Because companies are going to move, move in and out, and, down. Yeah. and they're going to move in and out of categories. Right. But we can look at historically that area of the market, right. no matter what stock was in it, what it's done. So right. that's what we really want to look at. When it comes to mutual funds, oftentimes investors will think that by choosing several of them, that that's diversification. However, many of the funds can have the following flaws. One is that they hold the same stocks, which we talked about. They buy and sell to each other and that the manager is doing the stock picking for you. So just remember that when you're looking at track record, when you're looking at mutual funds or you're looking at firms, just remember those things. So also something to remember too is this is kind of disturbing, but in, mu in the mutual fund industry, mutual funds are born and they're killed. Mm -hmm. now, Stick with me for a second, you're like, what? So a mutual fund, if it is not performing well, they will either, dis it will just disappear right. mm -hmm. or they'll merge it with a more successful um, fund to make the average look better. It's mm -hmm. like going to school and your teacher says, I'm gonna drop your lowest test score. What happens, your average ends up going up. So we're talking about what you can't see can't hurt you. Numbers That's one of the things fuzzy. behind the scenes. It's behind yes, definitely. the scenes. Um, so, uh, let's, in, in the current market volatility, oh my gosh, everybody's working on that and everybody's, oh my gosh, my 401k is so down. Meanwhile, they're 35 years old. Right, oh, exactly. So you got time on your side. Yeah. So what should people, what should investors be doing? Honestly, I believe that the stock market is volatile anyways. Right? It can be. I mean, markets go up and down. Now, the degree of volatility depends on, yes. it depends on there's lots of markets. Most people look at just the S&P as the market, but there's also other Right, markets. the financial markets. Right. Right? Exactly. Yes. So, first of all, I would say never panic. Okay? Never Obviously, panic. Obviously, you Absolutely. get with an investment coach that can really do an analysis of your portfolio so they can tell you where the danger zones are for you. But this is destructive, so it leads into um, market timing. And what market timing, in simple, what most people do is when the market goes down, they get scared and they get out. When the market go goes up, they want to get back in. And it's really crazy if you think about it. Am I going to Macy's, walk in and see this 50% off sale and say, now nah, I'm going to wait till the sale's over and then I'll come back? Exactly. Like, I mean, that's like the best scenario. Like, right. so, what? yeah, why would you wait until the dress is $200 and, like, right. and you could have bought it for $50 right. the day before? So, so yeah. when the market's down, it gives an investor, if they're working with a financial advisor that buy, you know, rebalances and buys one. Rebalance is important. So that's important. You know, you want that and just know like most likely the stocks in 10 years from now are going to be higher than they are today you're going to be fine you just got to ride it out and we had a client you know we all remember 2008 major market crash but it was the end of 2007 or really like the end of 2006 when the market started going down then all of 2007 I might be getting my dates wrong 2007 into 2008 yes sorry the end of 2007 First quarter, second quarter, third quarter, 2008, market's down. By first quarter, 2009, we had a client. She's just like, I can't take it anymore. I'm going to lose everything. She couldn't lose everything. You she know, was it, emotional. Yes. Exactly. And you know what? She moved out one month to the, like literally one month to when the market it started, started to recover. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's the problem is you have to be right twice. You have to know when to get out before it's too low and you got to know to get in before it gets too high. And nobody has to crystal no, ball. That, that crystal ball is not existing. You, know, you might be lucky today when that happens, but after that it, it, it's going to be over. Yeah. 
So. so yeah, you just gotta be, and you know what, we have this thing in our head, it's called the amygdala. This is like our, you know, like if your child runs out into traffic, you're gonna grab them, and your heart's beating really fast like that, that's what our amygdala does. So when we sense fear or some threat against us, like we're gonna lose all our money in the market, that amygdala goes off, and that takes a long time for that to turn off. So by the time the market has gone up some, you know, over time, finally you feel like, oh, it's safe to get back into the market. And then you're buying high and you sold low. So it's just a loser's game. So I know people have stigma about the stock market and we probably didn't practice this question, but I'm going to no, ask you anyway. Um, we, I know people have stigma about the stock. Oh, I'm not going to invest in the stock market. I'm going to lose all my money. So a few tips that I always work with, and you can tell me if mine is, because I'm not the professional, right. you are the professional in this yeah. industry, um, then, you know, as a few tips that I have is if you actually look at the data in the last 30 years, what is the average rate of return? There is a very good average rate of return. When, you're looking, when you're looking at asset categories or an index, you can look at that. When you're looking at mutual funds or stocks specifically, that's when it can get really dangerous. But you also don't want to put all of your money into any one area that has done well even over the last 30 years because let's just use U.S. large companies. They had a good run up until the 2000 crash. And then there were other asset categories like U.S. small and small value that did very well after that. And then we saw the same thing happening leading up to uh, the 2020 crash. So the thing is diversification is not different stuff in different okay. areas. Mm -hmm. And then also not stock picking within those areas. You do not know which companies will do well and will not do well. So you're, you're in my opinion, following a structured portfolio like we have, we're going to own pretty much anything that's in there. We have some filters, things that science, you know, economic science that's won Nobel Prizes says that's not a good diversifier. We're not going to keep it in there. It's more detrimental. But other than that, you really want to diversify over many asset categories, both in U.S. and international. And, and like uh, coming back to that point is overall, the overall financial markets in yep. the past 30 years. Absolutely. It's the, you, you have to be in it. You do. You know, because instead of putting your money under the mattress or in the savings right. account. So overall, you're not going to lose your pants if you're diversifying, if right. you're following, you know, you want to give some tips on, you're not going to lose your pants when? Well, one is if, you, if you're diversified enough and you got to understand what diversification really is, okay, just owning a bunch of stuff and even just having an S&P 500 is not truly diversification in my opinion. There's a lot of stock, a lot of holding in the largest stocks and very little in the rest. So that's one thing. And then what are you having offsetting? Like when the U.S. market isn't doing well, what do you have that's offsetting that? Or even if large isn't doing well. So you want to do that. Also is a real danger is being a victim of fraud in some way, shape, or form. You know, I just found out today one of our clients who had left, she got really scared. And unfortunately, she ran into a con man and now lost everything and so it's really important that you know how to verify certain things so that you, you can protect them. yourself and so that's one of the things that we do educate on as well as like how can you take the steps to protect yourself what information do you need to get and verify so that you're protected so that's one of the things we want to definitely um, make sure that investors know about so on that note we want to make sure that we um we understand that you know when you're, you're listening to the right people, you're vetting the people that you're listening to, not because they're on social media or not because they've, you've seen them. You have to make sure that you're looking at their background, what their experience are, even what their education so is. So much even more than that because everybody has that, but you want to get like GIPS audited returns. You know, you want to um, know who your custodian is. You know, nobody gives us money. Nobody writes a check to me. No one writes a check to Smart Plan Investing. It goes to a custodian, right. a third party bank that's going to keep your money for that's safekeeping. They have you know, fraud insurance. And so then you've got checks and balances between your money manager, your That's custodian. That's a great, great your, tip. So yeah. you really need that. Yeah. Absolutely. And you know, a lot of people just really don't know the right questions to ask. It's really uncommon sense in the investing industry. So what we do is we provide the education. Um, we do have an event coming up on um, May 31st. It's a virtual event. It's going to be hosted by my team out in Scottsdale. It's going to be virtual, so you know anyone can join. So if you're interested in that, if you want to uh, discover more about why these are so destructive, these myths, and you want to dive into the science behind it and see the evidence that we have to back it up, 
then you can just email me, jen at smartplaneinvesting.com, and I'll make sure that you get the information you need and register for that. And then we have free online courses you know, every month. Yeah. Well, we're definitely going to bring back Jen to talk more about investing because this is just a, the tip of the iceberg on, um, and it's a giant iceberg. So it's just the tip of the iceberg on, on investing, and we're definitely going to bring her back. Thank you, Jen, for... Uh, for giving us this investment. We look forward to hearing more. And we will, uh, in case you missed any information about Jen, we will all have it all in the notes on the videos. Thanks again. This is the Modern Savvy CPA.